All right, if you want to look in Luke chapter 17 this morning, we appreciate you all being here this morning. And um, again, we will have our quarterly business meeting tonight. You're welcome if you would like to come back for that. You're welcome to do that as well. And uh, it is a quarterly meeting, so we'll have uh, actually have a few items of business to cover uh, this evening. A lot of just kind of our beginning of the year items that we'll address. So uh, do keep that in your prayer today if you would. Uh, Luke chapter 17, as we begin this chapter, uh, we find that Christ turns his attention, or his, uh, his speech at least, toward his disciples. It doesn't mean that they were the only ones standing there while he was teaching, but it does mean that he turns his attention toward them. There are some things that as the time approaches now, getting closer, uh, every chapter that we go through is getting closer to his his uh, time of arrest and uh, crucifixion. As that time gets closer, he knows that, that he has to invest more and more into the apostles for them to be ready to take the mantle, so to speak, and carry it on as he will depart and they will take over that uh, sharing of the gospel with the rest of the world. So he begins here in chapter 17 addressing the disciples, uh, not just the apostles, but the disciples. And uh, he begins talking to them about four things. And I listed it there, and it's not a question, but statement number one on your sheet. Uh, it says, we find Christ teach his apostles on four different areas of Christian life in chapter 17. Uh, the first two we're going to look at a little bit this morning, that is forgiveness and faithfulness, and then the last two we'll look at probably next week, that's thankfulness and preparedness. And uh, those first two, forgiveness, we know that forgiveness is something extremely important among believers, something that we have to remember as we interact with community and society is that not all people are believers. And therefore, we have to be cautious what we expect from other people because if they're not a believer, they don't fully understand what forgiveness really is because they've not experienced it from Jesus Christ. So they, they don't know this forgiveness. So if we expect something from a non-believer, we may be expecting something that they don't even know how to give or how to show. And then faithfulness is something that uh, we have to have in order to live our life in the way that God would want us to in order to keep from becoming a stumbling block for someone else. Uh, our faith has to be strong. And Christ uses the example of a, a mustard seed, actually, which you know is very small, but yet has the potential to be large in life. And so he uses that as an example of how our faith can grow and how our faith has the ability to, uh, to carry us through life as well. So let's look at chapter 17, starting in verse 1, and we're going to read down um, at least through verse, um, through verse 19. We're going to focus really more, though, on verses 1 through 10 this morning. Verse 1 says, And he said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea, than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. In Matthew, the example he uses is seven times 70 or 77 times, depending on which translation. The point of his statement is that no matter how many times they ask for your forgiveness, you are to forgive them. It's not a set number. Uh, we sometimes get hung up on that number that I only have to do it seven times and then I'm done. But that's not what Christ was trying to get across. Verse 5, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith, which is an interesting request from them based on what Christ has just told them. So we'll keep that in mind. Verse 6, and the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? 
Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, and dress properly, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. This is an interesting uh, passage especially in today's time because it seems as though people have to have a tremendous amount of patting on the back to get things done sometimes. And Christ is really talking against that. Um, anyway, let's go on. Verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. There's something, in, and this is not necessarily the, the main focus of what we're going to talk about today, but there's something here in verses 7 through 19 that we find concerning just our expectation of a life in Christ and what our proper response is. And, and we find just kind of large summary here that, that these nine had an expectation that they should be healed. And so when they were, it was just what they expected. And there was nothing special about it to them. Except the one who, by all appearances, seems to be the one who was not Jewish. And he was extremely grateful for what had happened. If not cautious today, we lose sight of the many blessings God has given us. And we begin to think that they should just come no matter what. And we forget to stop and give thanks. Which is why sometimes during prayer requests I try to, to bring up the concept of praise items. Because uh, we need to be in the habit of thanking God for what has occurred. And not just putting in front of him our petitions. Although we are told to put our petitions in front of him. That's not, there's nothing wrong with that. But we also need to remember to stop and give thanks too. Because what happens in our life is not necessarily just what should be expected. But we should realize that there are blessings God gives that are we're not worthy of having. Um, what we're worthy of having is, is actually death because of our sin nature. But because of God's goodness, we have been given life. And, and we must remember that all that goes with that life includes all the blessings that God bestows upon us. So it's worth our time to stop and give thanks and not just treat life as an expectation that we should have. If you had to use one word to describe prayer, and that's the only word you could use every day, what would it be? Um... Well, you put me on the spot. Um, I think I'll spot. Thank you, Lord. Thank that's you, true. Lord. Yeah, that's true. And, and that, a lot of times that suffices for all of it. Yeah. And we that's don't true. do that enough. You know, yeah. there's times that I'll lay down at night and everything is going so good, you know, for my life that I just think I don't really have any. Well, I know there's always something he can do, you know. But I feel like it's selfish to ask when everything is going so good. So just thank you. I do. I do. There's times I've just laid there and thanked him for my home, mm -hmm. you know, for the breath that I breathe. Mm -hmm. But you feel selfish sometimes when all you do is lay there and just ask and ask and ask. Yeah, I don't know if you remember in, in Sunday's sermon, <laughs> there was an uh, illustration or example I used from a, a Ugandan that had looked at, at uh, all those who live in the United States and he said, basically, you're all rich. We forget that even 
because we live in a society that we have so much that we forget what we do have is actually blessings to us. The fact that we have running water in our home, uh, some of you may have lived in times when you didn't have that. I remember my, my grandparents' home, even when I was a young child, they, they had water to the kitchen sink and that was it. Uh, still had an outhouse that they used and, and all that. Um, didn't have a hot water heater, you know, I can remember, I can barely remember that uh, in my life. Yeah. I grew up. Right, and, um, and my kids have no idea what that means. You know, they can't even imagine not having a bathroom in the home. We had running water, you had to run out the well. <laughs> to get it. You had to ro go run, get the water, right? Um, but, but we can't imagine a home without that now. Matter of fact, we can't imagine a home without at least two bathrooms and maybe three in it. And, and yet there are still places in other countries where there are missionary groups that are going to put a well down so they can have water. So, you know, we lose sight of, of just all the blessings that we do have. And, um, and it is worth us pausing. And especially because we can, we can get hung up on the material possessions, but especially just the forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ. Because that's nothing that, that is guaranteed. I mean, it, let me back up. It's nothing that, that we deserve. It is guaranteed to us when we call out for it, when we ask for it. But, um, but it's nothing we deserve. God didn't have to do that. But out of his graciousness and his love, he did. And so uh, us taking time and thanking Christ for what he done is tremendously important for us to do. And so I think you see that in, in those last few verses we read. It's just that there needs to be a gratefulness about our life, which is that third item we had there in statement one, thankfulness. That is extremely important for us as a believer <coughs> to have. And sometimes we get kind of caught up in what we don't have and we forget to be thankful for what we do have. And, um, and I've been guilty of that myself. I'm not going to stand here and say I haven't. But uh, we get ourselves bogged down in what we wish we had instead of being thankful for what we Reed, have. I asked you that a while ago. One time I, I listened to it on TV or something, or maybe it was in a church service. And the pastor called on this older guy to pray. Everybody was waiting for him to pray, and he got up and said, Thank you, Lord, and sat back down. Sit down. Yeah, and that sums up a lot. Yeah, it does. All right, well, let's look. Um, now we'll get kind of to the focus of what we're going to talk about this morning. Let's look at um, question two. It says, what is Jesus cautioning us against in the last part of verse one? And then Romans 14, 13, what does it tell us? Look at the last part of verse one. It says, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one who, through whom they come. So what is he cautioning us against? I'm sorry. Tempting others. Okay, tempting others. Not giving in to the temptation. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. Is it not that they're... Well, let me just say it. it do you think it would be worse to be the person that sinned or the person that caused someone to sin? The one that caused someone to sin. The one that caused the sin would actually, according to what we see here, would actually be, be worse. Both are bad. I'm not saying that one's okay. Um, the caution here is that, that we need to be careful that we do not lead someone else into a sinful lifestyle. And we forget sometimes our influence on people, but we have a tremendous influence no matter who we are. And uh, we, we talk about this sometimes that even in a church environment, sometimes you don't know the little kids that are looking up to, whether it be teenagers or, or young adults or even older adults, but they do pattern their life after someone. And, and it's not always parents that they pattern their life after. So we have to be, be aware of the life that we live and the, uh, where we might lead others as well. So he cautions against that. If you look in Romans chapter 14, um, verse 13 says, 
Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. That is uh, extremely important, that we would never become that stumbling block. And it's probably extremely worthy of our prayer that we should pray, Lord, let us not be a stumbling block to someone else. And I don't know if that enters our mind very much. Uh, like we, we pray that, Lord, help us not to sin, maybe. But I, I'm not sure how much we pray, and, and, and I'm talking to myself more than, than anyone else. But how much do we pray that we not be that stumbling block for someone else? Because that's just as important you know, in our life. Uh, question three, remembering who was in the crowd around Jesus, who could Jesus have been speaking about when he spoke of the little ones, and who could he have been speaking about concerning those who cause others to be tempted? So when you look in verse, uh, um, verse two, it says, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than it would be than, than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. So who do you think one of the little ones to sin he might have been referencing? Children. Children? Okay. Who else do you think? Mine says lowly in rank. Lowly in rank? Okay. Um, he probably is referencing not only children, he is referencing them, but children in the faith in terms of young believers which would have been people such as, if we just kind of think through our minds, some of the young individuals. You could take an individual like Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector, and upon his conversion, if someone would have put a stumbling block in front of him, then it could have been very detrimental to whether he followed Christ or he didn't follow Christ. And so it's not always just an age, but it is a, um, a how mature someone is in the faith as well. Because... I mean, you guys know as well as I do, you can have someone that comes to an understanding of a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ at the age of 60 or at the age of 70, or you can have someone at the age of 7, and they're both influenced by what they see. And so um, we have to be cautious no matter the age around them, which, which means sometimes, you know, when we get in circles of maybe those that if we're outside of church and we get in circles of friends, we have to do, we have to remember that if we're not real aware of their spiritual life, we may lead them to, to stumble if we're not careful with what we do. Um, so the little ones would be possibly those who are young, but also those who are young in the faith. And then when he's speaking about uh, those who might cause others to be tempted, who do you think he could be speaking about there? Again, remembering who was in the crowd here, because you've got, you've got his disciples. We also talk about two other groups that usually are there. It's the, in terms, the Pharisees that were trying to arrest him or find something to arrest him on. And then uh, you have just the group that is, they're intrigued, but they're not disciples yet. They're just there because of the show, so to speak, to see what he can do. Kind of the carnival atmosphere, you might say. What if, uh, what if he was speaking about the Pharisees as these who may lead others to be tempted? Because if you remember, the Pharisees are the ones that have all the biblical, at that time, biblical knowledge that was available. They had Old Testament manuscripts. They had the prophecies. They had everything that was written. They would have known. And therefore, to those which much is given, much is what? Required or expected. So... Um, they had the responsibility not to lead others astray because they had the knowledge, theoretically, they had the knowledge, more knowledge than anyone else. So they had a great responsibility. So Christ is saying, look, if, if you have been blessed with tremendous wisdom or knowledge concerning him, which many of us have because we've had the opportunity to study the word for many years, then we have a great responsibility then. Whereas someone that maybe has only been a believer for two or three years may not have that same, in God's eyes, may not have that same responsibility because they've not had the opportunities that we 
we've had to know the text. Now, in, in Christ's time, it would have been the Pharisees primarily that he would have been speaking about that would have been the ones charged with making sure they didn't cause someone to stumble. But also, as he's speaking here, remember, he's training these disciples too because they are now going, when he departs, they're going to be leading this, this gospel message into the world. And so they have a huge responsibility because they've, especially the inner circle, um, well, not the inner circle, but the, the 12, the 11 that ended up, they've walked closely with him now for almost three years. They have the ability to know what the Old Testament prophets said and have them explained by Christ. So they have a tremendous responsibility. When you think in terms of someone such as Judas, individual that walked with Christ for three years and probably became a tremendous stumbling block for someone. We don't know who, doesn't tell us, but probably did. And, um, and Christ could have been, if you think about it, Judas would have been in this crowd. And yet he would have been speaking this very same thing. And Judas would have been standing there hearing this. And yet he still makes the decision that he makes. Which tells us that even today there are going to be people that, that hear the word, that know the word, that have been exposed to it, and still make, I'm going to use the term, foolish decisions. They make decisions that go against God. Sadly, it's not a good thing. All right, question four. Um, from verse three, what does pay attention to yourselves, or some translations say take heed to yourselves, what does that mean in the context of these verses? Should be the first phrase there in verse three, depending on which translation you have. I'll either say take heed to yourselves or pay attention to yourselves. Take heed. Take heed. <clears throat> to be very cautious of what you what you do, what you say, because you could be a stumbling block. And I mean, sometimes people do something just at the spare of the moment, and you've got to have your mind and your heart set to where if something happens, a cuss word don't come flying out or something, you know, that type of thing. That's you know, given time to think, usually we process maybe what our best answer or action would be. But I'm going to say 75% of the time, we're not necessarily given that time to think, in, but we're having to react maybe in the moment. And maybe it's more 50-50. But, but anyway, we, we have times where we have to react. And sometimes our reaction, the best reaction would actually be no reaction at all. And just to kind of keep ourselves quiet and, and maybe not, not answer the individual at that moment in time and maybe even just say, you know, I need some time to process this. And, um, and then be able to have that time to, to think about and pray about what we should do. Um, because if we act out of our human nature, which is what we tend to do when we just react uh, until we, we really grow in the faith, if we act out of our human nature, it's usually not best reaction. The more we grow in the faith, though, the more we become like Christ, then the more we react out of our Christian nature, which hopefully we, that's where we get, you know, in the progression of our life. But it is a, this, this statement is a, we need to pay attention to ourselves, what we're doing, uh, lovingly watch over ourselves and maybe even watch over others because we have a responsibility within the body of Christ to be on guard not only for ourselves but also to have that care and concern for our brother and sister in Christ as well. Now, what this is not talking about is, uh, there, well, we have to remember that lovingly watching over our brother or sister is not necessarily our blood brother or sister, but it is our brother or sister in Christ. <coughs> Because our blood brother or sister may not be believers. And if they're not, they're not going to understand when we come to them and say, hey, this is not the Christian character that you should have. Until they understand a relationship with Jesus Christ. And sometimes we put expectations on people that are not believers and they have no idea what we're doing or what we're expecting of them because they don't know what a believer truly is. So when Christ says this or makes this, this statement about 
um, brother looking after brother, he's talking about in terms of the kingdom of God. So people that would be believers in him. Um, we have a responsibility to those who are not believers to share the gospel and to get them to a point where they would accept and, and become believers to where they could be classified as brothers or sisters in Christ. And then we can start um, holding them accountable to Christian principle type things, which is so hard for us to separate in our society because, and we say this, but our country was founded on Christian principles, biblical principles. So it's hard for us to separate what is a good and moral and decent life just in terms of society versus the Christian walk that an individual should have. Those principles are the same in some areas, but yet when we try to hold an individual accountable from a Christian perspective and they're not a Christian, they don't understand what we're doing. But if they are a Christian and we try to hold them accountable, they, they will understand more of what we're doing. Does that make sense? My problem is when they profess to be a Christian. That's tough, yeah. Because if they profess to be a Christian, then they should open themselves up to allowing us to help them in their walk. And... And it really has to make us question then if they're professing that but they're not opening themselves up to let us help them done in the right way, then are they really a Christian? Which may mean that our conversation has to back up to, okay, let's walk them through the gospel instead of let's help them in their walk because they may not be walking at all yet. There are people who want you to abide by their values too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's... Um, had a sermon on this um, as well. There's there's personal preferences that we have that are not necessarily biblical yeah. items, and th there's nothing wrong with those personal preferences. Except I can't hold you accountable for my personal preference when it's not biblical, and you can't hold me accountable for your personal preference if it's not biblical. Other than just the respect that we would have between each other. But sometimes if you share that so much with someone, you can really push them away. You can. I don't want to talk to that guy anymore. Yeah. And sometimes we share it so much that instead of us remembering it's a personal preference, in our mind, it becomes a biblical issue. So what, what are we talking about personal, such as? Um, so uh, I hate to use this, but it's the easiest one. So personal preference can be that it is absolutely wrong for a woman to walk in church without a dress on. Um, biblically, there is nowhere that you can really make that, that argument. Um, you can make an argument that we should dress uh, very modestly and, and in, you might could even go as far as to say the best that we have uh, out of a respect for where we're going and what we're doing. But, um, but you can't say it has to be uh, addressed. So what if somebody come to you? I know a woman that wore pants one time, and a lady went to her and says, I could not believe of all people you would wear pants at church, and she refused to wear pants again. That's where you gotta, uh, you got to sit down and say, well, well, explain to me why you can't believe that. And you got to have the conversation of where did that belief come from? She was afraid she was going to be a stumbling block if she wore the uh, pants again, so she wouldn't do it. And that, that becomes then a personal preference of, I don't want to be a stumbling block. Um, and, and sometimes people can take these stumbling blocks way too far. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's go to a different example instead of women. Let's go to men. Um, there may be some who believe that every man should walk in with a suit on, suit and tie. There's nowhere biblically, and this is probably a better example, there's nowhere biblically suits weren't even a thing. Matter of fact, in Bible times, you would actually wear a robe uh, more like a dress than you would a, a suit or, or pants or something. And I think I've shared with you all before, if you go to some countries, individuals that wear suits are thought to be crooks. So they won't pay any attention to you. 
Now, you go to Panama and you wear a suit out of, when you get outside of Panama City, Panama, and you wear a suit, then they don't trust you because all the suited people are businessmen who have done dirty deals. So they won't listen to anything you say. So if you go down there in a suit and try to preach, you might as well forget it because they're not going to listen. So uh, for us to say that someone has to wear a suit when they walk in church is really, that's a personal preference, but I can't hold that personal preference to someone else. And, and someone can try and say, well, you shouldn't be a stumbling block to me, but that's not fair and it's not biblical because this individual is trying to hold you to a standard of their personal preference and nowhere is that a biblical issue. It's a personal item. Now, what that means is there needs to be a conversation between those individuals because that needs to be talked about so that the individual doesn't take it necessarily as a stumbling block but understands why someone would not feel as though they need to wear a suit. Those are just examples. There's a lot of, of different examples. Another one, hair. Hair is another one. Um, you can go to uh, even the type of music, uh, contemporary or, or traditional. You, know, you go back past, um, well, you get earlier than the 1800s and the music that, that we think has to be in church didn't exist. So, you know, we have to be cautious in saying that you know, traditional Southern gospel music is what has to be in church because it didn't exist when you go back before 1800 and they were singing the actual Psalms, you know, out of the Bible. So we have to be cautious with, with even that kind of thing. Now it's personal preference and there's nothing wrong with that. That's why we have so many different churches. A lot of that is because of personal preferences and we've agreed that some of those personal preferences um, are going to exist and that doesn't mean that a church down the road that wears jeans and a shirt all the time, that doesn't mean that they're wrong. And it doesn't mean that, that we're wrong or vice versa. It's just, that's, that's the, uh, it's the personality of the church. Uh, just the same as like traditional music or contemporary music. It becomes a personality of the church. But when you get to doing things like that, you've got to make, you've got to be careful because when churches start splitting, that's when the word starts splitting. Yes. Um, because they go can. from taking, you know, well, you should wear a suit to the word of God. I don't want this part in it. Because right. I've seen churches like that. They don't like what's being preached, so they just go their separate ways. And that's, that's where you've got to really be careful when you go into a, a church. That, and they're not all that way. Right. They're not. But that's, you got to be really careful with that. Mm -hmm. You mean the gospel don't change from a tie to Levi's? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nor from a robe. <laughs> no. But, you know, we, because of, of where we grow up um, and what becomes uh, culturally acceptable by us, we have a hard time breaking out of those traditions. sometimes traditions. Yeah, we have a hard time breaking out of those. Um, there was a guy I used to work with that uh, he lived in Minnesota and uh, was faithful attender to church, Sunday, Wednesday, faithfully. The month of July and I think part of August. But if you've ever lived in Minnesota, you know that that like days are are very short and very long, depending on what time of year you're, you're there. Uh, winters are extremely long. The month of July, they did not meet as a church because they took those times and they met with families or small groups in their church might meet or whatever, and they enjoyed the outdoors because they knew in a month they weren't going to get to enjoy it anymore. And so they didn't meet as a church. And I thought that was so crazy. And when I first heard it, I thought, man, that's wrong. And, then, you know, I had to remind myself that, okay, culturally they've done this and, and it works somehow. And they, they're not forsaking the gospel by doing that necessarily. Um, but and outside is a good place to worship. Yeah, that's right. And, and so, you know, it, but it was different for me. And, um, and so it was, it was hard. 
and, and there's a lot of those things. You know, it was different for me to, uh, when I went to Panama, to not preach in a suit. Uh, there's very few times, and I don't, I may have done it once or twice here, but, but for the most part, I, I'm typically, when I'm preaching, you know, teaching is not, but, but when I'm preaching, I'm typically in a suit, and it's just, it's just what I was raised, you know, in. It's, it doesn't mean that someone that's preaching that's not in a suit, it doesn't mean I think less of them by any means. It's just what I... And there may come a point in time where that changes. You know, if the, if the dynamic of the church changes to where no one wears a suit at all, um, there's a chance you could become unrelatable to the people that you're, you're ministering to, and you, you need to change, you know, that in order to become relatable. I don't see that for a while, but... but I'm see, saying. I thought that about the, the contemporary music that our young kids sing. Mm -hmm. I think one of the best things they ever did was put the words on the screen. Because older people, and I'm including myself in that, don't understand all of the words. But when you can read them, it makes a whole different outlook on the way that you see it. And uh, some of those contemporary songs, the actual words, are much more biblical mm -hmm. than some of the traditional songs we sing. Um, I always laugh about the song, you know, I Shall Not Be Moved. Um, and I understand the premise of that is, I'm standing on the word of God. I'm not going to be moved. But if you just take that, like if you if you don't understand that concept of it, then basically you're saying, man, I'm where I'm at and nobody's moving me. Well, that's really kind of against what God's word says, you know. <laughs> so it's depending on how you take them, you know, there's there's different different things. We have an eight-year-old great-grandson, and that's his favorite church song. Is it? <laughs> uh, you know, the other one that I kind of laugh at is... Um, I forget the name of it, but Lord, build me a cabin in the corner of Glory Land. Uh, that is so unbiblical. Uh, there is no cabins in Glory Land, you know. Um, and I know what the premise behind it was, that I'll just be satisfied with whatever. I know that's the premise, but when you actually read it and you look biblically at it, it doesn't, it doesn't really line up, you know, scripturally. So... It's, uh, but like you said, if you can't understand the words to it, or if you don't know, sometimes our immediate thought is, this is no good. Right. And, and uh, you've got so many older ones in here that's not used to that. Mm -hmm. And that whenever you, like I said, I can read the words on it, and it just, it touches me. Mm -hmm. but, um, there's a lot of, of cultural things. There's a lot of personal preferences. I don't remember how we got off on this, but... <laughs> Um, but there's a lot of personal preferences that we can bring into church that can be detrimental and can become stumbling blocks for people. I'll tie it back in there. Well, well a couple of changes before you leave. Uh, yeah, okay. A couple of changes that's happened since this pandemic. One is passing the collection plate. Yeah, that's right. And the other one is the music on screen up there. Yeah. Uh, those two things have changed in this church. Church time has changed. <laughs> you know, I've, I've often wondered what would have happened if we would not have had the pandemic. What would have happened if I would have walked in one day and said, okay, we're not going to pass the offering plate anymore, but we're going to have these boxes at the back, and that's where you're going to give your offering. Well, you got to vote on that, man. It'd be canceled. Yeah. <laughs> or if I would have walked in and said, you know what, we're going we're to split and have three different services. And we're going to move Sunday school to Sunday night. And um, don't quit using hymnals. And, and yeah, and we're you know, what if I would have walked in one day and said well, we're not going to have hymnals anymore? You know, um, those were all decisions. We wondered what would happen. We had know. no choice, did we? But we had no, and and you know, this is a testament to the church that we all understood that these were things that that we at the time, needed to do. It doesn't mean that we won't go backward on some of them, although the offering thing, I'd never thought about that. That offering plate's the dirtiest thing in the church because every person touches it. You know, I've never thought about that before. So, you know, I, I don't know that we'll go back to that, you know, every Sunday just to churches have that. been doing this for a long time. But they the church have. isn't suffering for it. No, it's not. It's well, not. That's kind of like the Bible study. I enjoy this more and even if there was more here, when I come at night, I have trouble hearing yeah. someone's comment over here that I'd like to hear, you know, because I pick up something good from everybody. 
Right. Yeah. You know, That's something we haven't been able to figure out yet is yeah. how to. to um, it's really been a blessing, I think, for me. Yeah. <laughs> it has me because, <laughs> for one thing, I don't drive at night. And so chances well, are I probably we, wouldn't be. We're about to get that way, but we don't <laughs> yeah. that, but, you know. Lord yeah, works in mysterious ways, don't he? You know, the other thing that, that we don't think about and, and probably would have had mixed feelings um, is the live stream that we do, which we're doing now. Um, and I don't know this, but I think there probably would have been some hesitancy if I would have brought it up you know, before about, well, if we do that, people are just going to stay home. Well, yeah, but you know, you got to weigh the you got to weigh the, the other side of that of okay if we don't do it is there some we're not going to reach and um, and we still have to weigh that you know but but at the same time when we weren't able to have church some of you anyway that, that are able to watch online we're still able to watch you know some of what we've done so there's a there's a lot of things that like you said God works in mysterious ways um, and. Through some of this, God may have been showing us that there's some things we needed to be doing that we weren't, and and it might have been very difficult for us to do them if we would have just tried to do them without something that showed us maybe we needed to in the moment. So sometimes uh, He just has to move you because you're not going to move. That's right. <laughs> you know, that's just the way we are. We're stubborn. That's exactly right. You know, I remember when uh, my kids were little, there were times that I told them to do something and they just wouldn't do it, and I had to move their hand to make them do it. And, and uh, God is that way sometimes. He just has to move us along. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, let's look at question uh, five, I believe we are. Um, what do we learn from verses three and four, and how well is this carried out in our society today? What about among Christian people? And is there any differences? So verses 3 and 4, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Um, is so that the same sin seven times? Could be. <laughs> I mean, you know, somebody slaps you and they say, I'm sorry, and then they slap you again. Well, I'm sorry. You know, how many times does it take before you know they're not sorry they slapped you? Well, a lot of it depends <laughs> on their, their heart. I <laughs> could be. Um, so when we look at, so we learn from this that there is, um, among brothers, there is a teaching that we should help correct. I want to use this, this rebuke word because it has a different meaning today than it did then. Rebuke actually means to help them, not like to point a finger at them and say, you're doing terrible. And we think of it today as like, you're doing terrible. That's not what Christ meant by it. But we are to, to hold them accountable, maybe is a better way of saying it. So there's a teaching that we need to hold people accountable that are brothers. But then uh, we also have a teaching there in verse 4 that if they sin against us, that we are to forgive them no matter how many times that they do it and say, I repent. Now, carrying with that is repentance. Remember, repent means not only to be sorry, but not to do it again or to have the, um, the desire to not do it again, which doesn't mean that we won't do it again, it, but it means that we have the desire not to do it again. So we're working on it. So someone that slaps you seven times for the same thing, I mean, that would be, he's, you know, he's not trying. Yeah. <laughs> years ago, a preacher, a bunch of guys standing around talking, some of them using a little foul language. You let a woman walk up or a preacher walk up or somebody in the church they knew that Christian. Conversation changed. Did like turn the radio on and off, you know. As soon as they walked off, you know, they might go back just like they were. As far as that being slapped, my superintendent, when I went to school, he said, your freedom ends where my nose begins. <laughs> I always, I've stuck on to that. Um, looking at Eric, question five, how well do you think this is carried out in our society today? Probably not very well. Not very well. <laughs> I mean, the forgiveness thing doesn't seem to be working very well in our government. Um, but 
but beyond government, because it's easy for us to look and point fingers there. How well does it work out? And if you bring this really home, how well does it work out even in our families sometimes? And sometimes among even husband and wife, how well does this work out? And, um, and among siblings, you know, sometimes but then you take it a step further, and what about among Christian people? Because that's really the ones that are accountable for doing this. You know, we can't hold people that don't understand what forgiveness is accountable to forgive because they don't understand what it is. We understand as believers, we understand what Jesus Christ done for us. The sacrifice he made, the pain that he went through for us to be forgiven which means that we may have to go through that type of pain to forgive someone else sometimes. And yet we have to be willing to do it. And not only once. Could you imagine if Christ only forgave us once? I never looked at it that way. <laughs> we got to be thankful that yeah. he does it in multiple I times. I mean, I guess because you just know that God's going to forgive you and the human part of us is totally different. And I never looked at it that God forgive us more than once. That's why he never put a um, like he says, turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. That Again, the implication of that is not just seven times and if you go to Matthew, it's not just 70 times seven or 77 times, depending on which translation you have. It's not a number. It's he was putting a number out there that seemed to be much larger than what they would have ever expected him to say, which was getting his point across of, you continually forgive them, which speaks to what he does for us. And don't keep bringing it up every time. <laughs> you see people do that and say, well, I forgave them for doing that to me. And this is five years later. Well, I forgave them. And they just keep bringing it up. Yeah, I'm not sure that's really forgiven. <laughs> it's not forgotten for sure, that's right. Um, you know, if a brother sins against us, we are to privately and lovingly inform them and help bring resolution to the issue. I'm afraid. Uh, sometimes in churches in, in years past, we've been more willing to publicly point these things out than we have been to privately go to them. And we've probably pushed some people away by doing that because we didn't have the love for them to go privately to them, but we wanted to bring shame, so we publicly brought it out. Now, there is a... There is a, a method that Jesus records in Matthew for uh, how we deal with someone who has done wrong. And we privately, lovingly go to them. If they don't listen, we take someone with us. If they don't listen then, then we bring them in front of the church, which the implication is a group, not necessarily have them walk up in front of church. That is uh, probably push some people away from church in the past. And um, if you can guarantee that every person in the church was lovingly, was going to lovingly look at them when they came in front of the church, then that might work. The problem is if you've got 100 people in here and you just bring them in front of church, there's a good chance that not all 100 people are going to lovingly look at them in that way, which is why you select who you take and you, uh, you make sure you take people with them that will lovingly look at them and, and help correct them and not, like Don said, keep bringing up five years and ten right. years down the road what's happened in the past. Because that just, that, that just breeds anger in someone. That's right. And it doesn't let them move past it. No, I mean, it's, no, it's constantly bringing it into their life. All right, we are... Um, um, we can quit at verse 4. It's 
uh, or we can go ahead and finish. It's up to y'all. If y'all want to quit, we'll pick up next week at verse 7, or I'm sorry, verse 5, and uh, which we're probably not going to get past that tonight with business meeting anyway. So uh, if y'all want to, we'll just quit here for today. We'll pick up with question, uh, well, let's cover question 6 real quick, because that, and then we'll pick up with question 7 next week. So question 6, what is our purpose for informing a brother about sin in their life? Bring them to a point of repentance. Uh, our viewpoint should be love toward them in hopes that they repent of the sin in their life so that they live a closer relationship to God. Because that, that should be our hope is that not only our life, but every person around us grows closer to Christ. We can't make them do it, but, but we can help them along with that, which means there's no set way to go to a person because it depends on the relationship you have with that person, how you can go to them. Um, in the same way that, that, like sharing the gospel, there's no set way necessarily, but it depends on the individual, the relationship you have with them, how you can approach them with that. But, but underlying everything that we do should be a love that we have for them, and that should drive us in all that we do. So. But if you dissolve all that, what do you do with the gossip? <laughs> well, hopefully the gossip never happens. <laughs> That's the problem that um, probably has plagued churches, churches. Mm -hmm. is the gossip side of it. And, and that's um, my polite way of, of dealing with that was saying that's why you only take loving people with you. Yeah, right. <laughs> because if you truly love them, you're not going to be gossiping right. about them. And that has probably destroyed many walks with Christ. All right, let's uh, let's close with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, we'll pick back with uh, question seven. We'll pick up there uh, next week. So, um, well, Don, you care to close us in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we come to you today, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house, study your word. Lord, we thank you for Brother Kevin for leading this class, Heavenly Father. We thank you for each and every one that's here. We thank you for just loving us and taking care of us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I figured he would stand up and say, thank you. <laughs>